Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome everyone to the service here at South Hill. Uh, well, we've got a pretty good crowd considering everything. Uh, a lot of prayer requests this morning. Uh, I think I'll just go ahead and go through these prayer requests uh, so we can uh, uh, pray for them here as we uh, have our service here today. Uh, Sheila Jennings' mom was in the hospital and she is out now but not doing uh, all that well so I believe that she's going to need uh, surgery on a valve and heart so we so we want to remember Sheila and her mom and Shirley's daughter Kathy had test run she was in the hospital uh, is home now not doing all that well either and uh, also uh, Shirley Shirley has a checkup on Tuesday and uh, Shirley's son David uh, I think his procedure is uh, scheduled for December the 15th and also Cole's grandmother Ann McDonald is on a respirator in Little Rock uh, with the with the virus and is doing better he says and also Michelle and the Franklin family are in quarantine because Michelle tested positive for the for the plague I call it that's what it is it's a plague you go back to the all the plagues of Egypt and uh, you know it's it is a plague throughout the world and we hope that the Lord will end this thing soon okay I hope I covered everyone um, and uh, let's see thank Patty for her, uh, giving me the list of of who's to serve today and uh, Kent will lead the singing uh, Travis will have the reading uh, Steve will have our prayer uh, Brother Scott will have our lesson and uh, the Lord's table will be attended by Lance and closing prayer by Layton okay let's begin with a prayer our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day you've blessed us with, and we're thankful that you've allowed us to come here this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we hope that what we uh, uh, say and do here this morning and the praise that we offer is acceptable to you, and bless God as he brings a lesson to us this morning uh, from your word, and we thank you for your word that uh, guides us in this life and tells us how we should uh, conduct ourselves and treat other people as we walk the pathways of this life. We I uh, pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> 1018. 1018. We'll think the first, uh, uh, second, and last. Joy to the world that all is come, where all receive our King. Let every heart prepare in room, and nature sing, and heaven nature sing, and heaven and heaven nature sing. The Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. Rock fields and floods, rock fields and plains. Repeat the sound. Repeat the sound. Repeat the Repeat. Repeat the sound. Enjoy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love number 503 
First and last. So in sorrow I wondered my spirit oppressed, but now I am happy, securely I rest. From morning till evening, glad carols I sing, and this is the reason I walk with the King. I walk with the King, hallelujah. I walk with the King, praise his name. No longer I roam, my soul faces home. I walk and I talk with the King. O oh, soul, it is fair in the lowlands of strife. Look up and let Jesus come into your life. The joy of salvation to you he would bring. Come into the sunlight and walk with the King. I walk with the King, hallelujah. I walk with the King, praise His name. No longer I roam, my soul faces home. I walk and I talk with the King. We're 442. 442. Oh, that all, oh, that all, all the 
mighty friend above can be his forevermore. He is everything to me, to me. He is everything to me, to me. And help everything I always always me. I will have Second Peter, first chapter, starting with verse 1 through verses 11. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have a, obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust but also for this very reason giving all diligence add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our Holy Father, we come now before you. We want to talk to you a little while, Heavenly Father, and tell you our cares, our troubles. And we want to praise you from the depth of our heart and soul for the goodness, the mercy, and the grace you've shown toward us. Through many trials and tribulations of which there are many in this country that's going on right now, Heavenly Father, and you know the source and the cure for every one of them, Heavenly Father. Help us not to be overburdened by these cares and troubles, but help us to look to the goal that we have in our lives, that we set, that we're, let, that we're not going to let anything deter us from the goal that we have in our, in our lives, that we walk faithfully before you here on this earth, that we look to you as the source of all good and perfect gifts, and for that home that you prepared for those who will remain faithful to you. Help us every day to keep that in mind and have that as the first goal in our lives, Heavenly Father. And help us to prove it by the way that we live and the way that we talk and act. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we want to start by talking about the uh, virus and things of that nature that's covering the earth, that the plague that is overcoming 
so many people and we want to start by praying for those of our congregation for Michelle and and for all of those people that Mary enlisted we want to pray for every one of them Heavenly Father that you would work out good things in their life for them that you'd heal those according to your will who need healing and others who are disturbed and and troubled about things that they would draw closer to you and look to you as the source of all good comfort, help, and strength. And help us, Heavenly Fathers, we live each day to remember that we are here only for a short time, that we need your help and strength each day that we live. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll grow closer to you because of coming together as your children and mingling our voices in songs and prayer to you and that we just draw closer to each other and to you and become stronger in the faith. Heavenly Father, we know that the way we become stronger in the faith is to open your word and to read it and study it and meditate upon it, to let it rule us and guide our lives each day that we live and to live by it to the best of our ability. Help us to have that determination to live that God-fearing life that you want us to Help us to be a source of strength and help to our neighbors and friends and all who need our help. Help us to be an encouragement to them and to the weak and to all people, Heavenly Father, that others might look to us and desire to live that kind of life that we live. We know, Heavenly Father, that, uh, that we need to uh, study your word and let it rule within our hearts and minds. Help us to deliver that word to anyone that will listen. Help us, Heavenly Father, to prove that we believe it by the way that we live. Heavenly Father, we pray for Scott as he opens your word this morning and talks to us and tells us things that we need to pay attention to, that we need to live by. Help him to deliver that word in a way that we can easily understand it, but help us as hearers to pay attention to those words and not to be casual hearers of Heavenly Father, but be doers of those things that you've laid out in your word. To be those kind of Christians that we need to be and that we must be in order to please you. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessings upon all people who are sick or troubled or distressed in any way. And we pray, Heavenly Father, especially for the spiritual welfare of people. The spiritual wellness, Heavenly Father, is the most critical thing there is that above all else that we must found to be faithful before you when we leave this earth, Heavenly Father, and that's the greatest desire that we have for all people, that they would obey your word and, and live faithfully by it. Heavenly Father, we pray for those members of your body who have fallen away from you. We know there's many in just about every family, and we pray for every one of them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that their eyes would be opened and that they'd realize the most important things in this life is how they live this life, how they lead this life, that they will one day meet you in judgment. And Heavenly Father, help us not to, not to be careless about the way we, we live here on the earth. And we just pray that those who have fallen away would return to you. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who preach your word everywhere and especially overseas in trying conditions in other countries, Heavenly Father, where they're persecuted for some reason or another. We pray that they would, would persevere to the end, that they would be, be diligent to, to uh, preach your word in its simplicity, in its truth, in its completeness and that many souls who haven't heard it might be able to hear it and believe it and obey it. Heavenly Father, above all else, we are thankful to you for that great gift of your Son who came to this earth and lived that perfect life to show us how to live. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would look to him as our example, and we pray now, Heavenly Father, that you'd forgive us of every sin in our life that lies between us and you, that we would Forgive all others who sin against us as that you would forgive us as we forgive others. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessings upon this country, upon the leaders of it and the people at this troubled times. We know that there's many troubles and 
there's many ungodly and and vile people in the world and they are really showing up at this time and we pray heavenly father that that good might conquer evil in this election in these times of, of voting and that good pr would prevail and that that good people would rule over us and enact laws that would look to you for guidance and help in the way they should should rule over us Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with us each day that we live. We know that you will, that you won't leave us, but help us to cling to you each day as, as you would want us to. Help us to with joy and contentment and peace in our lives to, to walk with you each day and to leave this earth with, with peace and contentment to the day that we can live with you forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. <clears throat> love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born. Hey, so it's been a been a busy day already. It's just not quite eleven o'clock. Uh, a couple of things I want to mention to you. Uh, one thing that I we you know we support the uh, sheriff's ranch every year, and uh, I got a uh, letter from them this week. And there's a card, uh, "Merry Christmas" from the ranch, and then they sent something that they wanted us to write to the kids at the ranch. I could have just done this and sent it, but I, I didn't really want to do that. I'd like for someone, so if you'll see me after the service, it'll probably be a first come, first serve basis, so don't knock one another down trying to get to me. But uh, no, seriously, 
if someone would like to take this, there's a, uh, you know, a return envelope, no postage necessary. And there's just like uh, a few lines here at the top of this, and you'll tear this off and send it back to the kids at the ranch. So uh, if somebody will do that, I will be happy to give that to you and let you uh, write something to them from the congregation and, uh, and send that on their way. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, and I thank uh, Steve for his prayer today. You know, very often people will say, uh, I enjoyed your sermon. That was a good sermon. I got to think, of what is a good sermon? You know, Kent Bennett down at Antioch used to just delight, especially when a visiting preacher came to town. After the service was over, they was coming out, everybody saying, good sermon, good sermon. Kent would say, that was a warm sermon, brother. And he was just hoping they'd ask him, what do you mean you warm sermon? And so he'd tell them, not so hot. <laughs> so so that, was, uh, that was what Kent pulled on. But I, what is a good sermon? I want to read from James, and this is what uh, Steve was praying uh, today. James, the first chapter. Uh, in verse 22 down through verse uh, 25. He said, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You know, this tells me there are two aspects or two levels of a sermon. And one of them, and what is here in James, has to do with the mirror. Now, if a mirror is broken, or if a mirror is cloudy, or if it's old, you know, you've seen some that you can't hardly see a reflection in, then if the mirror is faulty, you don't get a good picture. And to me, that mirror represents what I'm doing right now. When I get up to present a sermon, can you understand, can you hear me, first of all? Can you understand what I'm saying and the way that I put things together? Is it clear or, you know, am I just going from Dan to Beersheba and you don't know what I've said after I'm finished? So that's one aspect of it. It has to do with the presentation, the content of a sermon. And so most of the time, whenever somebody tells me good sermon or I enjoyed that, I think that's what they're talking about. I enjoyed that presentation. Uh, I had one fellow that was a preacher years ago when I was living in Oklahoma City, came out one day. I've never had anyone tell me this. He said, that's a good speech. <laughs> and I think I knew what he meant because he may not agree with everything I said that day, but he said, you did a good job presenting even though I didn't agree with everything you said. Well, that's okay. But there is a deeper and a more important aspect, and James touches on this too. And I don't have any control over this. I wish I did, but I don't. I only have control over the presentation, the content, what I put out to you. But a good sermon is not really good if it does not elicit a response in the hearers. Now, I can try to encourage you, and I hope that in some way I inspire you, you know, that, to hear what I say and then to put it into practice. But whether my sermon is good depends on a whole lot more than just whether I make a good presentation. It really depends on what you do with what I've presented to you. And so a good sermon to me is one that is well presented, sure enough, but it is also one that changes people's lives. And that's a good sermon. So I know I'm going to get a lot of, that was a warm sermon today, so that's, that's all right. I'll take it. Uh, we are going to look at some precious things today in the first, or the, the two books of Peter, first and second Peter. And so we have about uh, seven verses that we'll be looking at. But I want to start, first of all, with some definitions and some synonyms. Of course, precious, we know how to pronounce it. 
most of the time when we see this word as an adjective and it is modifying like an object, a substance, or a resource, and it means something of great value, you know, something that's not to be wasted or to be treated carelessly. For instance, a precious work of art. Occasionally we'll see it used as a noun uh, to address a person. Sometimes we'll use this, especially of babies, you know, we use it this way. Don't be frightened, my precious. Or we'll say, oh, she is precious, or he is precious. By the way, that's a predicate adjective for you English majors out there. <laughs> so uh, it's still a modifier, really, not so much a noun, it's a predicate adjective. But, you know, we use it that way as well. But the adjective form of it means something of high price or great value. That's what the word means. So it's very valuable or costly, like in a precious metal. It's something that's highly esteemed for some spiritual or non-material thing, you know, a moral quality like precious memories. You know, and we have a lot of those. So, dear, beloved, like a precious child, affectedly or excessively delicate, that doesn't sound too good, but it means to be refined, kind of, you know, have precious manners or good manners. I don't remember people saying precious manners too often, but good manners. Then, then there are some synonyms. Expensive, love, studied, favorite, dainty, uh, dear, cherished, over-refined, fastidious, inestim inestimable, adored, beloved, choice, costly, darling, exquisite, fine, idolized, invaluable, irreplaceable, priceless, prized, rare, treasured, valuable, valued are some synonyms. So if someone tells you that you are precious, what they really mean is that you are someone that they hold in high esteem. Someone whose relationship that they have with you, they value. Now, the Greek word that is used in all seven of these passages in First and Second Peter is taken from this root. It's uh, Strong's number 5092, Time, and from T.O., which means accord honor to or to pay respect to. And so properly, it's perceived value, worth, literally a price, especially as perceived honor. Uh, that is what has value in the eyes of the beholder. Because, you know, sometimes somebody say of a little baby, isn't he precious? And someone else say, well, that's the ugliest baby I ever saw. <laughs> so sometimes it's in the perception, you know, of the person that is, is valuing it. Uh, the value, the weight, honor, willingly assigned to something. So a definition is a valuing or a price, and the way we use it is a price or to honor something. So some form of this Greek word, time, is used in all of the passages that we're studying today. The first one, and we'll uh, take time to read these, is in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, verses 6 through 9. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. Where Paul, or Peter said, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now he talks here about the fact that we rejoice in trials. You know, over in Romans, the fifth chapter, verses three and four, he talked about how that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And so he talks about this maturing process that we go through when we go through various trials. So Peter begins here by saying, you know, you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while maybe you're going through some of these trials, because the genuineness of your faith, 
you see, is being tested in these trials. And it turns out that it is going to be more precious than gold. You know, a faith that is tested by fire leads to praise, to honor, and to glory as Peter uh, presents it here. And he talks about the fact that even though Christ was unseen by them, you know, in the night that Jesus prayed, in the night of His betrayal, it's in John 17, remember He prayed not only for the apostles that were there, but He said, I pray also for those who are believed through the word that you speak. Those that have never even seen Me, you know, but still believe the Gospel. And so even though He was unseen, yet they believed in Him to the saving of their souls. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide here. I, I ran across some interesting facts about gold that I didn't know. Probably you don't. I've got s several of them here. You know, gold is extremely ductile. A single ounce of gold can be stretched into a gold thread five miles long. The first gold coins appeared around 700 B.C. On the periodic table of elements, gold symbol is AU for all you chemistry fans out there. God's atomic number, our gold's atomic number is 79, and its atomic mass is 196.96655 AMU. The melting point of gold, this was interesting, Celsius, I'll give it in Fahrenheit because that's what we use, 1,947.97 degrees. That's hot. Gold is found, that's found in riverbeds and sifted from rushing water is called alluvial gold. That's what all the gold rush was about out west back in the 1800s. Gold has been discovered on every continent on the earth. Gold has been mined for over 5,000 years. The coffin found in Tutankhamun's tomb I think I got that right, contained around 1.5 tons of gold. A ton is what, 2,000 pounds? So that's about 3,000 pounds of gold. Gold is the most non-reactive of all metals and does not rust. You know, sometimes you get those rings out of the gum machine. You know, you put the quarter in, get them out there, turn your finger green. Gold won't do that. Gold is so pliable that it can be made into sewing thread. It can conduct heat and electricity. The average human body contains 0 0.2 milligrams of gold. Human bones contain 0 0.016 parts per million of gold. Gold ranks 75th in order of abundance of the elements in the earth's crust. There is an estimated, mostly unextractable, 9 billion metric tons of gold in the sea. One troy ounce of gold nugget is rarer to find than a five carat diamond. You know, every once in a while, the crater of diamonds here, not long ago there was one. Somebody found a diamond there. They'll find, a, you know, a one carat. I don't know what the largest one's ever found there. Gold is chemically inactive and is not affected by air, heat, or moisture. There are more than 400 references to gold in the King James Bible. It's estimated that 142,000 tons of gold have been mined throughout history. Pure gold is so soft that it can be molded by hand. Now that was something I didn't realize. So you couldn't have a pure gold ring because it'd just keep doing whatever your hand did. You know, it just go into all kinds of shapes. Gold is edible. Gold flakes may be added to food and drink. I don't recommend it, but I guess you could. High purit uh, purity gold is odorless and tasteless. 22 carat is the standard for UK gold coins. That's 917 parts per thousand. Scientists in Australia have found gold particles in the leaves of eucalyptus trees. And finally, one cubic foot of gold weighs a ton. Now that's just a cubic foot. That's 2,000 pounds. But unless this is something more important. And you know, gold, isn't it an amazing metal? It is, isn't it? It's highly valued. 
But here's an interesting fact about genuine faith. Genuine faith is more precious than gold. If you have a genuine faith, you have something more precious than gold, according to Peter. 1 Peter, the uh, first chapter, verses 17 through 19, Peter writes further, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. He speaks here of the precious blood of Christ. He talks about the fact that God is not partial in His judgment. He didn't pray, play favorites. You know, sometimes we may grow up thinking, well, I go to this church, so I just know God is, you know, He's partial to us. He's, he plays favorites with us. God's not partial. He judges honestly, and fairly. You know, we have trouble doing that sometimes, don't we? Especially sometimes with our own children, and this is probably especially a fault of mothers because they are so protective of children that they won't really honestly sometimes judge things about their kids or make it fair. What kind of fear is Peter talking about here, though? He said that uh, they're... He said to spend your through, throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Does he mean we're supposed to be just cowering in fear all the time, afraid that God's going to zap us with a bolt of lightning? You know, because we stepped this way when we're supposed to step that way? I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about a cowering fear, but he's talking about a healthy respect. You know, those that own guns, they talk about having a respect for a gun. Are they talking about just being afraid every time you see a gun, you know, going hiding under the bed? Or No, that's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about is having a healthy respect. You know, you don't point a gun at someone. You always say, you know, you assume that a gun is loaded. <laughs> no, that's the kind of respect. It's kind of like the respect that we would give a demanding boss. You know, we may not just be cowering in fear, although sometimes someone may make us feel that way. But if we have a deadline or if the boss has told us to do something, we know we need to get it done. We need to get it done by that time. But he says here that our salvation was not bought with gold or silver. You know, we already looked at the preciousness of gold. Silver is another metal that we make a lot of jewelry and things out of and has value. But our salvation was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so not only is a genuine faith more precious than gold, but the blood of Jesus is more precious than any of the elements that we have here. He was without blemish and without spot. Let's go on to 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 another place where he uses uh, this word. He said, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He speaks of Christ as being a living stone. Now, you know, the only living stones that you and I probably ever see are the ones on Disney movies or in other animated things. You know, we'll have stones that talk or stones that do different things. But out here in the world, you know, a stone just doesn't do that. You know, a rock doesn't just come up and start talking to you. And it doesn't have all these attributes. But he speaks of Christ as being a living stone. Now, I think he's, of course, literally not a stone. We know that. But he's talking here something about the aspect of a stone, though, isn't he? It is a living 
solid, something that we can really, you know, put a foundation on, I think is what he means here, a living stone that was rejected, he said, by men. His own countrymen, of course, we know crucified him. But he was chosen by God, that, and he was precious, and he was valuable to God. From before the foundation of the world, we're told Christ was the lamb that was slain. And so he was precious, he was valuable to God. He was priceless, he was irreplaceable, he is invaluable. There's no price that we can place upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is invaluable. But he also talks here about us being living stones. And again, this is an interesting concept for us to contemplate. We know we're not rocks. You know, someone may call you a rock head. You know, they may, may call you a name like that, but they're just you know, using a metaphor, making some fun of you. But he says we are living stones that were being built up a spiritual house. So you have Christ who is the living stone, who is the chief cornerstone. And then we are being built upon this foundation, a holy priesthood, he said, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And you know what are those spiritual sacrifices? Well, those are the good things that we do. They are the prayers that we pray that Peter later will even talk specifically about the prayers that we offer, the songs that we offer. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but when we're singing songs, it's like an offering that we're giving to God. That's a spiritual worship that we're giving as His people in this house of God. So, Christ is a precious stone. Christ Himself is precious. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8, in this same chapter we continue, he said, therefore to you who believe, He is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. You know, to whom is Christ precious? To whom is He precious? He just told us. To those who believe. He is precious to those who believe. Remember over in 1 Corinthians 1, we read that it pleased God, by when, when in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. He said, for the Jews are looking for a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jew, a stumbling block, and to the Greek, foolishness. And then he goes on to talk about how the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Well, to those who believe, to those who accept this message, Christ is precious. But to the disobedient, He's just a stone, a stumbling block in the way which the builders rejected. And we know, of course, His own people crucified Him. Many of His own people rejected Him in His day. And today, people still stumble over Him and they're disobedient. And there's all this pressure a lot of times that people bring to bear upon those who do believe, trying to get them to disbelieve or at least to give up some of what they do believe about Christ and about His church and about His kingdom and to conform. And you know, Paul talked about that in Romans 12. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, to those who believe, Christ is precious. To those who believe, His teachings are worth following. To those who really believe, His teachings are the truth and are the real foundation of successful and happy living. He is the chief cornerstone of this spiritual building, which is the church. And you know, there are several metaphors that are used. The church, 
the kingdom, the body, the family. All of these refer to the same group of people and they are those who believe, those who are saved through the precious blood of Christ. Well, this one is in here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Somebody says, well, I didn't see precious in there anywhere. Well, it's actually in the New King James, the word honor. You know, he's just been talking here about the wife being submissive to her husband like Sarah in the first part of this chapter. And then he talks about a husband dwelling with his wife in, with understanding, giving honor. And so here is where the Greek word time occurs in this verse. In the New King James, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. So what he's saying is give honor or give preciousness to the wife. And remember the word precious means to what? Have value? To have worth? To give honor to? And so what he's saying is husbands should value their wife. They should give honor to their wife. This means understanding the value of a good wife. And remember the passage from Proverbs 31, 10 and 11, who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. And ruby is way down the scale from gold, but you know what? Her, her worth is better than gold too. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. As husbands, we need to remember that this word, time in the Greek, it's translated honor in the New King James, but it means that you have a precious wife. You have someone who is to be valued. And he says that together you are heirs of the grace of life. Second Peter 1 was the passage that we read today, verses 1 through 11, and we're not going to read all of this again, but we're just going to highlight a couple of things here. You know, God has given us everything that we need to grow into faithful Christians. And let's just read here from verse 2. He said, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ as His divine power. He's speaking of God's power that works in us. Has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So God has given us in Christ and through the gospel everything that we need to grow into faithful Christians. And he then begins, you know, to talk about adding to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. In the old King James are the words that are used. No, it's a great effort that is required on our part in order to be fruitful Christians. You know, weeds just grow, don't they? You don't even have to help them. They'll just spring up everywhere and they'll choke everything out. You know, you have to take care to take weeds out. But if you want a productive plant, you have to you know, plant it, you have to nurture it, you have to feed it, you have to take care of it. And our faith is really like that. We have to add to our faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness to mature in Christ because the reward is, of course, exceedingly great. Down in verse 8, he said, For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 11, he said, For so an inference will be administered to you in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Of course, he also warns us that if we fail to grow, if we just let our faith falter and we don't add to it, that we may be in danger here. 
He said down in verse 9, for he who lacks these things, in other words, who doesn't add to their faith, is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. In the second chapter, verses 20 through 22, Paul went on, or Peter went on to say, For if after they have escaped the knowledge or are the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. So he says, you know, not to grow and to abandon your faith is even worse than never having had it to start with. So our faith is precious. It's something that we need to add to these Christian virtues. In verse 4, as we read here, he talked about, you know, we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises that he says, through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is a world through lust. You know, the thing that really jumps out to me is the inheritance that we have in Christ here is so awesome. You know, we use that word about a lot of things. Don't we? Oh, that was an awesome ride I just went on, you know. Ferris wheel or that roller coaster. Ah, that was awesome. Well, there isn't anything as awesome as the inheritance that we have in Christ. And we may have been offered some great promises in life by different ones. Some of them may have been kept. Some of others may not have been kept. But there is no promise as exceedingly great and precious as the promise in Christ Jesus. And here's the thing. He says, we are partakers of the divine nature. Now to me, that's something that's awesome. Because he is saying we become like Christ. As we grow our faith, as we add to faith, nurture, uh, you know, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, all these things, that we become partakers of the divine nature. That's a great promise that we have. In addition, we escape the corruption that is in the world through lusts. And finally, we have that hope of eternal life. So the precious things that we see here in the book of Peter, there are a lot of things in Christ that are so precious. And by that, we don't just mean some little sentimental feeling that we have about it, but the fact that it is of inestimable value. It is priceless. The promises and the gifts that are ours in Christ Jesus. So may we hold tenaciously to His promises. And may we add to our faith all the virtues that we may be partakers of His divine nature. If your gospel subject today, one we can assist, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling all sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love He has promised, Promise for you and for me. Though we have sinned, He has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly tend.
tenderly Jesus is calling, calling those sinners We've come to the part of the service this morning where we gather around this table and we take the time to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to remember his life, to remember his death, to remember his burial, and to remember his resurrection, and to remember that he went to that cross spotless and clean. But he took our sins with him to that cross that gives us hope of everlasting life. What he asks us to do is to come around this table on the first day of each and every week to remember that sacrifice. And at this time we do that. And he gave us the bread that represents his broken body. He gave us the fruit of the vine that represents his shed blood. So this morning, as we partake of these emblems, let's remember that sacrifice that was made. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning to thank you for all the many blessings you give us. We thank you, Father, for the time that we have to come here this morning. We thank you especially for 
the plan of salvation that you have put before us. We thank you for your son Jesus, and we thank you for the sacrifice made. Father, we ask as we partake of this bread that we all may partake in a way that is well-pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Father, once again, we come to you to thank you for your son. And Father, we pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, that we may remember his blood that, that flowed down his body as he made the sacrifice for us. Please help us to take this in a well-pleasing manner to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As that concludes the, the Lord's Supper this morning, we also take this time to uh, give thanks for the many temporal blessings that we've been blessed with. Uh, we've all been, been blessed very richly, and at this time we'll, we'll give thanks for those blessings, and uh, so if you would bow your head, and we'll do that this time. Father, we also come to you this morning to thank you for the temporal blessings of life. We thank you for the abundance of everything you've given us for the many comforts and conveniences and the many, many things we take for granted every day. We ask, Father, that we may now at this time give back part of what we have been blessed with that we might continue the work of the church. We thank you for all that you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this concludes our worship service uh, to God here this morning. Uh, you know, it seems that uh, there's trouble on every side. And Steve, of course, mentioned all the problems, you know, the problems that uh, we have in the world today. Uh, everything changes. But there's one thing that does not change. It's God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. So we can certainly depend on him to be the same. No wavering with God the Father and his son. Remember Sheila's mom, Shirley, Kathy, Shirley's daughter, David, Shirley's son, Cole's grandmother, and Michelle and her family. And all the others that, you know, each one of us know about. We need to bring them before God and uh, God the Father and ask for his healing. He is the great healer. And pray for our country, too, that it will get back to being the God-fearing nation it once was. What else should be said? Next Sunday, 1030, we'll worship again. I think next Sunday will probably be that we collect the money from the city. So if uh, you have anything you want to put into that. We'll okay. Next Deadline next Sunday for feeding the pig back there for a gift to whoever they uh, 
decide to, to uh, donate it to this year. And also, the I know the food basket is uh, about just about full back there. Thank you for that. And if, you know, uh, I don't have to be the one that delivers it. If anyone else want to, wants to get involved in the fun, to go visit the homeless, you know, uh, that'd be great. You know, might do, might do, you know, might, it, it helps me to understand, you know, and be thankful for how God has blessed me and my family. Uh, those, those folks are in need. Some by, you know, circumstances beyond their control, and then some, of course, is because of their actions, but they, they need help. And uh, I think God will bless us for helping them. What else? Nothing further than Layton. You gonna dismiss us, please? One thing I was going to say, Scott, your preacher that said a warm sermon, at least he didn't say lukewarm. <laughs>